Shalom Aleichem. Aleichem Shalom. Okay, so we're going to begin. Um, we're live streaming, so hi to everybody at home. Uh, there's like 20 people here, but hundreds of thousands who are watching on, on the live stream. This is like, this is like Letterman. Like if you ever go to watch the, like the old Letterman show, there'd be like 100 people in the audience and millions of people watching at home. It's like the same thing. It's like the same thing. All right. So hi at home. Hi here. Uh, welcome back to, if, I don't know if you've all been in the, in the temple or maybe haven't been in the, the chapel in a while. Uh, I certainly haven't run a program in here in 15, 16 months. So this is, uh, this is pretty cool. Um, feel free, the, the wine, the water, the falafel uh, is free. So, okay. Um, so what, what we want to do tonight, this, I don't think this will be a, a very long program, um, but I hope it'll be as fascinating for you at least a little bit uh, as, as the experiences that we had. Um, and, you know, the, you kind of have to think back a little bit because the war in Israel has been over for a while and a lot has happened since. Uh, even in Israel, it's, you know, it's been over for a while and a lot has happened since. They have a new government. They had the return now of corona there, which is, which is very problematic. Um, and we had this horrible tragedy here in Miami, which, you know, in some ways is our own mini 9-11. And we've had two families from our temple that lost people in that building. So it's been a, it's been a horrendous, uh, it's just been a horrendous week here. Um, last night, I went up to Sunny Isles with about eight other rabbis to meet with Nachman Shai, who is the Israel minister of the diaspora. And he came along with the Israeli team uh, that is helping at the, at the Ground Zero site in, in Surfside. And uh, he was actually here, Nachman Shai, who's been a member of Knesset for 20, 30 years. So he's been a long time. He used to be the Dover Sahal, the speaker, the... Uh, of of the Israeli army, like the repre- the spokesman, so he was a spokesman for the Israeli army. So um, I said to him, you know, two weeks ago, we were in Israel in solidarity with you, and now you're here in solidarity with us. I said, that's called family. You know, we're we're fam- we're the same family, and it was a, it was an emotional moment. That, that we had when we, when we thought about how, how profound that was. I mean, what are the chances that I would be in Israel two weeks ago on a solidarity mission, and two weeks later their, ministry, their minister of the diaspora would be in Miami on a solidarity I mean, you couldn't make that up, that that, that could happen, and that's what happened. So we, we, had, a, we had a very interesting uh, discussion uh, last night. and talked about a lot of different things, but mainly focusing on what happened in Surfside. Um, uh, all of us, the clergy here, we've all been down there to the to the site. We've all been talking to our families, um, and uh, been part of these community uh, programs. And it's it's been really awful. When we planned this night, obviously we had no idea this was going to happen in Surfside, and so it sort of puts a, you know a damper on everything that that's been going on. I guess um, so. Uh, Let's, you know, let's try for an hour or so to kind of put Surfside to the side for a minute and allow ourselves to, to focus on what's going on in Israel um, and why we put this trip together. So as the war was starting, we were getting ready for the holiday of Shavuot, if you remember. Um, and so I was getting ready for a Shavuot program here that nobody would come to. Just like today, I was getting ready for this program that hardly anyone would come to. That's what I do for a living, is I spend a lot of time preparing programs that no one will come to. Um, although there are thousands of people watching at home, so that's fine. Um, uh, and I thought to myself, as the war started, and we're sitting safely here, wouldn't it be powerful if I could go to Israel and lead a Shavuot service from Israel, 
for the congregation back here so that we've had a connection to what was going on there and uh, to show our solidarity with what was happening in Israel. So I went online. I saw that I could get a plane ticket for $700. I called a friend, uh, a rabbi who is the vice president of the reform movement, who's in charge of Israel, and I said, let's go. And he said, you'll never get a visa. So I called the, I said, Psh. I know the people in the Miami consulate. I called the people in Miami consulate. I said, I want to go. And they said, you'll never get a visa. <laughs> and I said, okay. That was, that was the end of that. So then the war was winding down. And I said to a couple other rabbis in town, we need to be there. I tried to go during the war. I couldn't get there. Not because of the war, but because of Corona. Couldn't get a visa because of Corona. Normally, you don't need a visa. You just go to Israel, buy a ticket, and you go. But with Corona, you need a special visa. So I said, listen, the war is over. If we get a group of rabbis from Israel who want to go on a solidarity mission, I promise you, through the Federation and through the Israeli consulate, we'll be able to go. So a couple of people said, the war is over. Well, you know, what do you want to go there for? And I, I said, listen. The war is over, but there's still scars. And this is, what we're suppo- this is what you should do. And this is what rabbis should do. And I actually, in my own naivete, thought every rabbi in the country would be going to Israel. And I found out later, by now, there were maybe three or four solidarity missions from America, period. There was a big one from New York. There was a big one, from, not such a big one, but one from D.C. and one from New Jersey. And us, and that was it. I think now maybe there's a few more that are going, but they're really, that's it. Now, not that many people necessarily wanted to go with me, but then they saw that the UJA from New York had one. And they said, well, they're going. Uh, maybe it'll look bad if I don't. Or that wasn't my argument. My argument was, you know why you should come to Israel with me? Because it's the right thing to do. That's it. It's the right thing to do. Let's go. We're going to go for three or four days and we'll come back. You all have discretionary funds. It's not going to cost you anything. I mean, I charged it to you guys. You know, I didn't have to pay anything. You guys paid for it. What do I care? All I had to do was this program, throw out some free falafel, and we'll call it a day. Right? So I think you're not going to have to pay for it. Let's go. Ah, but I have a bar mitzvah. We're going Sunday night to Thursday. You, the bar, we're not going to miss Shabbos. You're going to be fine. So, slowly but surely, uh, a few rabbis started to commit, and a few rabbis started to commit. And by the end of the few days, we now had 18 rabbis who wanted to go. And it turned, and this is them. Uh, Now, it looks like a ragtag group. But, but this, I mean, you would look at this on Facebook and say, you know, who these losers. But this is actually a very impressive group of people. This is, this is a tremendous group. Now, I spent the whole trip telling them that my congregation is bigger than all of yours combined. So, uh, I mean... Yeah, I mean, they don't come to anything, but, but on paper, we're way bigger. Right, no. Touche, right. Uh, no, actually, there's some, there's some people here. Uh, this guy here, he's the senior rabbi of Temple Bethel in Boca Raton. He's at the competition. You know, we're, you know, we're bigger, but whatever. Nobody's counting. Nobody's counting that we're 1650 and he's 14. I mean, nobody, nobody needs to know those numbers. But, but this is an amazing group. And, and what was so special about this and what we were trying to point out is that in our opinion, there is no more Zionist community in the United States than Miami. And if, if that's true... How do you not go? If you're representing that community that you constantly say we're the most Zionist community in America, then how do you not go? And this group of people, they went. So we put the trip together, and um, the goal of the trip, so when I called the, by the way, what's special about our trip compared to all others? Reform, conservative, orthodox, reconstructionist, male and female rabbis. Do you know how hard that is to do? To, I mean, it's not easy to put something like that together. Um, and, uh, and a couple of representatives from Federation. 
Uh, so it was really a, an amazing trip. What we wanted to do, and I, I organized the, with the tour operator, and basically what I wanted, we used the one, we used uh, you know, the reform movements, thing, which is a little tricky when you have Orthodox rabbis. So what I said to them was, listen, I don't really care what we do. I honestly, uh, there's two things I want to do. Other than that, I don't, it doesn't matter because I don't want people to say the reform rabbi, you know, controlled it. He made us go to all this nonsense that we don't care. So it had to be something that everybody was going to appreciate. So we basically said we want to do two things. And I want to show you the pictures of all those things. We want to go to the south by Gaza. And we want to learn about how those people are living there. In Hebrew, Aza, right? But in English, Gaza. Um, we wanted to learn about how those people dealt with the war. And we wanted to go to Lod. And I'll explain what Lod is and why, why we needed to go there. A Lod is basically a city right in the middle of the country, not far from the airport. Uh, and we, we wanted to go there because of what happened during the war. On top of all that, we added some very interesting speakers. The first night that we got there, uh, first of all, we stayed at the Orient Hotel in Jerusalem. <sighs> what a hotel. Oh my gosh. I never even stayed there before. Uh, and I probably, I don't know if I'll ever stay there again because I like being closer to Ben Yehuda Street. I like being overlooking the old city. But man, is this, it's relatively new. It's gorgeous. Here's the problem. We were there, I was in Israel for five days and I gained five pounds. Uh, I, literally, I literally gained one pound a day. Oh, so so here's, here's what happens. You go on this trip, you show up to this breakfast, this huge breakfast buffet. And you say, to, now I usually don't even eat breakfast. I used to start with lunch. So now I'm eating breakfast. I'm already over my calorie count for the day. And I say, all right, you know what? I'm going to go up and I'm just going to have sat, like they had the chopped, you know, Israeli salad with the, uh, the cucumbers and the tomatoes. Yeah, drizzle a little 10,000, or 1,000 island dressing, but just a little bit, a little bit of cheese and some olives. Very healthy. But then you eat it and you're still sitting there. And you, you know, the bus isn't leaving for another 45 minutes and you're sitting there in these conversations and you're like, all right, might as well go back up. And, but, you know, by the time you've left, you've had 17, you know, pancakes and four, you know, and so then, I mean, just when you're like ready to vomit because you ate so much for lunch or so much for breakfast, it's time for lunch. And the tour guide tells you, we never want you to eat on an empty, on a, on an empty stomach. That's their goal. So now you're eating a huge buffet. is is unpleasant. So... Uh, these are not your problems, but, I, you know, I mean, it's, it's annoying to come back five pounds heavier. All right. What do you do when you get to the airport? Your first stop, PCR test. That's a lot of fun. So we went from there to, like, two hours before we got out of there and got all the tests. But all right, so what? We're in Israel. We go, drive to Jerusalem. Our first meeting is with Yaakov Katz, who's been here twice, to Beth Am, the editor of the Jerusalem Post. And, you know, we had kind of an update on what's going on in Israel with the new government. And at the end, if you're interested, I'll be happy to explain what's happening with the new coalition, how Naftali Bennett is the new prime minister, what does it mean for Yair Lapid, who's what's called the Rosh Hamem Shala Khalifi, which means like the, the alternate prime minister, which means in two years he'll become prime minister if this government still exists. And I'm betting that it will. I'm betting that, it, well, even though it's the most razor-thin uh, uh, coalition you could have, I think that they're going to survive uh, two years, and I think they may even get some stuff done. I'm hoping. I'm hoping. I actually like this coalition, even though it's the most bizarre, ridiculous coalition ever. Um, but we'll see what happens. You know, um, I'll, I'll say a little more at the end, but in order to make this coalition for the first time ever, an Israeli coalition had to take a Muslim uh, party in the coalition, and uh, an Islamist, you know, not like a, like a communist or socialist kind of Muslim group. This is an Islamic Mansour Abbas from the Ra'am party. Pretty hardcore in their Islamic outview. How did this happen? Because of Bibi. Huh? Bibi, 
for the last four years said the, the way to stay prime minister is to just keep having elections, that nobody wins. <laughs> and as long as nobody wins the election, I'll just stay prime minister until we have the next election. And he got away with four of them. And he just kept doing it and kept doing it. I told you right here in this room to another class that nobody came to that the, what happened at the end of the second election would be a good uh, indicator of what's going to happen in the third election. When the third election results came out, I said, yeah, this would be a good indicator of what's going to happen in the fourth election. When the fourth election came out, I said, I think they're going to do it because if not, this country is just going to fall apart. Because what happened all the time that there was no government was there was no budget. And with no budget, none of these organizations were getting their funding. And the country was starting to fall apart. And it was, it was crazy. And if you don't believe me, go to some of the agencies that we went to and see what they did without funding and how miserable it's been. And what the toll that took on the government, on the country. Well, so now, Bibi, in order to finally make a government this last time, made an offer to... Abbas, Mansour Abbas, not Mahmoud Abbas, Mansour Abbas, and said, I I'll welcome you into my coalition. And ultimately it didn't work out. Because when, you know, when he took Abbas, he lost Smotrich. So if you take from the left, you lose from the right. Because the right side, I won't sit with the left. Well, if you take the left, I won't sit with the right. And it didn't work out. Well, Naftali Bennett comes in, and he says, I'm going to negotiate with the Arabs. And the Likudniks went to say, how could you do that? And he said, Bibi taught me how to do it. Bibi made it possible for me to do that. So because, by the way, what, one thing people don't remember is why did we even go to a section, second election in the first place? We went to a second election in the first place because Bennett left the coalition because he refu Bibi refused to make him Minister of Defense. So if you look at the beginning to the end, of the first election to the fifth to the fourth election. The first election started because Bibi didn't want Naftali Bennett to be Minister of Defense. And it ended with Naftali Bennett being the Prime Minister. I mean, you can't make that up. I mean, it's just unbelievable how all of that played out. Okay, so let's go through this a little. I'll show you where I've been. These are all pictures that I took from my phone. And I just lost it. Get it back. What I do? Carlos, what I do? Did I unplug it? Okay. I had it perfect. <laughs> ah, thank goodness. Okay. Gracias. How do you? Okay. Um, by the way, before I left, the day before I left, I wanted to meet with um, I wanted to meet with one of our top officials in Miami, in order to send regards from Miami uh, to uh, to Israel. It's really important that we have good connections here with with. Oh! <laughs> Carlos, what am I doing? I guess we can't move it. It's sensitive. But yeah, take the case off. It's a really good case. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so anyway, before I, before I left for Israel, I spent a day here meeting with some of Miami's top officials in order to be able to have the right message to send. So I met with Billy the Fish, and I told him, you know, you know what do you want me to send to Israel? So, all right, so Joe. Okay. This is the same group as this. It's just a different picture. So I didn't go with two different groups. It's the same people. Okay. And, and so is this. This is, again, this is the same people. But the, okay. So our first stop was we went down to the south. Um, and we went to uh, three cities. So one of the cities that we went, we went to Kfar Aza. What does Kfar Aza mean in English? 
Kfar is a village, and Aza is Gaza. So Kfar Aza is a kibbutz that is literally right on the border of Gaza. When I say on the border of Gaza, what does that mean? It means there's a fence, and then there's their fields that are their fields, and then there's another fence, and then just maybe a kilometer or so is Gaza. And so we'll talk about the balloons in, in a little bit and what those balloons are, but do you see, I, it's hard to make out, but this here is a bus stop. Uh, and this here is a weird blue structure. Do you know what that blue thing is? A hiding place? But what, how else what might they call it? A bomb shelter. It's a bomb shelter. So every, in, down south, when I say down south, I mean what they call Otef Aza, which means the Gaza envelope, the area that surrounds the Gaza Strip of Jewish settlements. And down there you see Kfar Aza, Sderot, and the big city towards the top of there is Ashkelon. And so this is in that area. And that's a picture of, it's a little hard to make out, but that's a bomb shelter. And it could take a direct hit above ground, right? Above ground. And you would be okay. You would survive a direct hit in there. So every, bu every uh, bus station, bus uh, stop has one. And they're all over the place. Now, if a bomb were to come, if a rocket were to come, you, have, you will hear a, what's called seva adom. Two words, seva adom, which means the color red. But what it really means is red alert. A rocket is coming. And it's really loud. And you hear, seva adom, seva adom, really loud. From that point on, if you live in this area, you have 15 seconds to get to a bomb shelter. 15 seconds. So imagine I told you, you know, you had 15 seconds to get to the sanctuary because a rocket's coming. You know, some of, some of us might make it. I mean, I know I'll make it. I'm in, you know, well, maybe not now after the five pounds, but... but <laughs> Before the five pounds, I, now maybe 20 seconds. But what if you have a broken ankle? What if you hurt your hip? What if you're deaf? What if you're blind? What if you're in a wheelchair? Okay, this was happening every 15 minutes during the war. Every 15 minutes. So what did people do? In most apart, well, in all apartment buildings... They don't have bomb shelters, but they, what they did is you have like a building, and then they added on another room. It's a bonus room. Uh, and when there's no war, it's actually nice. You have some extra space. But they added on another room that is like that reinforced concrete that could take a direct hit. Now, someone was actually killed in a room that hit direct hit because it had a glass window. And the glass shattered and came in and hit the person. So now they, have to, now they have a different way of doing it. You're actually supposed to leave the windows open so that the glass, because if it takes a direct hit, the window, you don't see anything. It's just to allow air. I mean, it's reinforced concrete. But if, if the window's closed and that spot gets hit, the, the glass can go out and smash. So you're supposed to leave it open so that that doesn't happen. Um, and there's a way to do it. But this is how they're living. Imagine every, for 12 days, every 15 minutes, you had to be in a bomb shelter within 15 seconds. And it's, it's horrendous. Just to hear it once, to hear that loud noise once is, is traumatic. And so one of the things we did was we went in Ashkelon to a trauma center. And we talked to these people and so they had a 400% increase in people coming for psychological trauma during the war. And there was this one story, we heard about this guy who said, I can't get my son to come out of, the, out of the, the safe room. So, even, right, even then, you know, you would say, you know, it's pretty scary. You want to be close to the safe room, but to sit in a safe room for 12 days is, is not healthy. So he went to the trauma center and they said, well, how old is your son? He said, he's 28. I mean, this is the psychological toll. By the way, they don't use the term po uh, post-traumatic stress. There's no such thing as PTSD in that area. Why not? Because there's no, there's no post. It's, they're continuously in a traumatic stress. So, okay. So that's what the shelters look like, and it just gives you an indication of how they live. Um, okay. Now, 
This is Kfar Aza. Um, actually, this is on, no, I'm sorry, this is not Kfar Aza. This is um, right on the border of Sderot. Have any of you heard of the city of Sderot? Sderot is the city that's been taking Hamas rockets for years and years and years. It's literally right on the border. And the thing about Sderot, actually, it's a very beautiful area. It's a very nice town. Sterot means boulevards. And there's big boulevards. It's a really beautiful place. But in the early days of Hamas's rockets, when they had Qassam rockets, the really crude ones that didn't fly very far, this was all that Hamas could reach. So they were the ones who were getting pounded, and nobody else really got pounded. And the idea of sending a rocket somewhere outside of uh, you know, that area was very foreign. And Hamas would never dare even try to do it because it was crossing a red line. And, but it sort of became okay to just bomb this area. And these people are furious about it. So if you go down there, you'll see all kinds of you know, political posters saying, you know, why don't you care about us like you care about Tel Aviv? You know, that's that, or Jerusalem or so forth. So it's hard. You can't tell from this picture. But why did we go to this area? Now, this is in a field right behind Sderot. So looking, if we were looking that way, I guess it would be east from, from where, this is where our bus was going. But looking that way, less than a mile, we could see the, the building complexes of Stay Road, the apartment buildings. Now, you can't really see it at all here, but if you look right there, that's an Iron Dome installation. Do you see it? It's right there on top of my pen. It looks a little bit like R2-D2. Uh, that's, a, that's an Iron Dome installation. And so this was... There's a better view. It's a better view. Now, um, we were not... When they took, I was surprised they let us take pictures. Um, uh, so they came over and said, listen, there are rules for pictures. And I said, that's true. You can only take pictures of me in certain places. So <laughs> apparently that's not what they meant. So actually the soldiers, uh, they actually had a pretty good sense of humor. They were a lot of fun. Um, so I, I said to the soldiers, um, there were a few of them sitting there. Now, when I started going to Israel when I was young, to me soldiers were like these, you know, huge, you know, like superheroes. Now they look like kindergarten kids to me. They're like, eight, you know, 18 years old. They look like they're 10 years old. I mean, and they've got guns that are bigger than they are. And, I mean, your, your life is in the hands of these kids. You wouldn't even let drive your car. You know, I mean, if they were that, if they were that age in this country. They mature very, very quickly uh, because they have to. And, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't let a 17-year-old drive my car in this country. These kids are handling, you know how much those things go for? This is, uh, that's millions of dollars of equipment right there. And each time, do you know how much, here's one thing we learned. A Hamas rocket costs Hamas $500 to launch. Uh, approximately between three and $500 to launch. Every time one Iron Dome missile goes up to intercept a rocket, that's $100,000. Israel spent $2 billion on Iron Dome in this last war. So when the Israelis came this week to Joe Biden and said, we want you to replenish Iron Dome, it's a fair bit of change. And when America did it, we should be very grateful because Israel is... Israel's out of them, and they can't afford to pay for new ones. And America replenished it. So this is a big deal that America was willing to replenish them. Um, okay, so that's what it looks like. And that's me um, and two other rabbis. Now, what's interesting about this picture? Not a lot, um, except what they said is if you take pictures, you're not allowed to take pictures with any buildings behind you. Because then... If it gets on social media or something, the Hamas people could figure out where you are. But apparently that could be anywhere. So if anyone asks you, you know, where, where was this picture taken, 
Tell them Homestead. Right, right. Or Hialeah. I mean, whatever. But, but we, we weren't allowed to give away, because you knew every single one of us was going to have it on Facebook within about four seconds of you know, being out of there, uh, as soon as we get back on the bus where there was Wi-Fi. You know, the, really, the only, the only time we really roughed it was when we were you know, in between the restaurants and the bus, and there was no Wi-Fi. Then it was, it was very tough. But this was, this was incredible. And uh, I said to the soldiers, is it quiet now? You know, th- things quiet. And uh, one of the soldiers looked at me and he said, Karega, which means at the moment. Uh, in other words, at any second, these 18-year-old kids could have to run over and operate these things. And so I said to them, is there a skill to it? You know, how is it, do you just drop it in? I mean, does, how fast do you have to reload them? And they said, it's very much a skill. Some people are better at loading it quicker than others. And it's very interesting. Um, but they were these sweet, delightful kids, basically, um, who really, you know, if they were American, they would be seniors in high school or freshmen in college. You know, that's who these were. Um, same group. This, by the way, in the middle, that's Alan Litwack, who's the rabbi of North, uh, Temple Sinai of North Dade. And on the left is uh, Dan Levin, who is the senior rabbi of Temple Bethel in Boca. Uh, here you have on the right, Jonathan Birkin from Aventura Turnberry. And on the left, that's uh, Josh Broidy, who's from uh, uh, Palm Beach uh, Federation, Palm Beach County Federation. Wonderful guy. It's also an Orthodox rabbi. Uh, these guys are great. I mean, these guys are these guys were really great. Um, I, you, this guy, I heard he said. He said to the other guy, "Is that really Jeremy Barris?" <laughs> he said, "Is that really Rabbi Barris?" So yeah, yeah. I, I think that's what he was saying. I, I didn't I didn't hear exactly. Um, but, I mean, these guys were so pleasant and, and so kind, and uh, they're protecting the whole country. By the way, you see behind is uh, Ellie Wolf, who's a Chabad rabbi from uh, Aventura. Um, okay, this is a home of a guy named Adi. Adi is a lawyer who lives in Ashkelon. This is Ashkelon. And he has three kids, two dogs, and a, he's probably uh, 50 years old. Uh, mid-50s maybe, and a wife who just passed away of some illness. I didn't hear what, but unfortunately she died. So Ashkelon is very, very close to Steyrot. I mean, 15, 20 minutes away by, by bus. And uh, they took uh, probably 900 rockets or something over the course. And they were pounded. Um, and uh, he heard the Seva Adom, the red alert, and he went into the safe room of his house. This is a beautiful home. That room you're looking at is just the kitchen. It goes on much further. He had a private pool in his backyard, which is kind of rare in Israel. Uh, I mean, it was really a beautiful home. He was a successful attorney, and he ran into his home because he heard the red alert, and he went into his safe room. We went downstairs in the, uh, near his, uh, he's got, like, you go down a a little a few steps and there's uh, his bedroom and like a playroom area and then behind it there's a safe room you know a shelter that he basically uses as his music room These are, there were drums and guitars all over the place and that's his safe room and we went in there and he showed it to us and they also have you know the like round windows you see on uh, cruise ships or on boats he had a room like that uh, like a window like that and it had a pipe coming through and we were like what's that for he said, that's in case it's a chemical attack. This is how they live. That's in case there's a chemical attack. Then we have a special piping to bring us different kinds of air and stuff like that. It's a very fancy shelter. Uh, but the, so he ran into that safe room and he heard a bomb. And when he heard the, the bomb, he said it was a loud boom. And he said, I knew that it was somewhere in the area. He said, I figured it was a few blocks away, but I heard... He came out of his safe room and recognized, no, it was his kitchen. It, it, this house took a direct hit. Now here's the interesting thing. Two things happen when someone's house gets bombed. First thing is, 
a representative from the Federation of America comes with a check of $1,200. Because by the time the government gets you their money, it takes a little while. But that day, when a bomb goes off, a representative of the American Federation comes to your house and says, this is from your friends in America. It's pretty amazing. So when you give money to Federation, and this isn't, a, I'm not raising money. If I was raising money, I'd show you the new building. But, uh, <laughs> but, but when, you, when you support Federation, one of the things that happens is when, a bomb, when someone's house blows up, someone shows up that day. Here's a check from your, friends in, from your friends of Federation in America. And he got one. The other thing that happens is the government comes right away and fixes your house for free. You don't, so there's that you don't have to worry about. What was interesting about this is this was maybe uh, two weeks later. It's almost done. The rest of his house was fine. He was able to still live in the rest of his house. This room, which was his kitchen, was bombed. Uh, the guys fixing it are Arabs. Arabs blew up his house so that other Arabs could fix it. And it's surreal. No. No. Um, so... Uh, this house was being fixed, but that's a house that took a direct hit. It was really fat. The guy was just delightful. That's his dog. I knew my kids would appreciate that. It was a sweet dog. Um, that's Adi. That's the man whose home was bombed. He was a very gentle man. You could see that's, uh, the woman there is Rabbi Loibin, Joanne Loibin. She's an associate rabbi at Temple Beth Shalom on Miami Beach. Um, and to the left in the maroon shirt is Rabbi Spey. Uh, who's a rabbi, I forget the name of the temple, but it's the Reformed Temple in uh, Hollywood. Um, but you see the circle, the circle window. That's in case of a chemical attack. That, that circle right above his forehead. Um, by the way, that's uh, Andrew Jacobs in the purple. He's a reconstructionist rabbi from somewhere in Broward. But I'm, not, I'm not sure where. Wonderful guy. Um, we really bonded. It was a, a fabulous group of rabbis. Um, so that was him. Okay, this is Kfar Aza. This is a kibbutz. And that is, uh, if you can see that, it says Ma Moadonit, which means that's the club, like the pub or the clubhouse of the, of the kibbutz. Now, I don't think I told any of you this, and nothing may ever happen to it, so don't get excited, because uh, probably nothing's ever going to become of it. But over Corona, I wrote a novel uh, about Israel. Uh, and one of the scenes... Has a, it takes place in a pub in a kibbutz. And uh, my editor said, uh, there's no such thing. I never even heard of a pub on a kibbutz. I said, every pub. So I said, that's, that's the, what a pub on a kibbutz looks like. Because she said, you know, the way you describe this, it, I don't see this a pub. So I took a picture. Said, oh, yeah, you're right. It is. Yeah, it's nothing. Okay. So anyway, that's the pub at Kfar Aza. Uh, and, you know, if you're going to hang out at Kfar Aza, that's where you want to be. I mean, that's where the party is. So, I have no idea. I was only there for an hour. Um, okay. This is a woman named Chen. Chen is one of the spokespeople for the kibbutz. And you can't really tell. You'll see from the next slide. But she has a closet there full of rockets that have landed on the kibbutz. And those are the remnants of the rockets. Um, and she does the tours of the kibbutz, so she's allowed to keep them. Whenever a rocket falls in Israel, the army comes and takes it. You don't get to, like, keep them for your collection, but she has a collection for visitors. Uh, and what she has in there are rockets from each of the wars. She's, and they're written, the army writes on them. So the army comes and says the date that it founded, the date that it landed, uh, and where it, where it landed. So she had, this is from 2006, this is from 2008, this is from 2014, and she had a whole collection of them. And there they are. Those are actual rockets. And you can kind of see, you can, uh, the writing here, that the army wrote here, Kfar Aza, and the date, this one is from 08. All of these, this one, this one, and this one, are from past uh, operations. But this one here was from this most recent conflict. Now, probably the coolest thing that she showed us that we weren't allowed to take pictures of. By the way, a lot of people, when, when the rocket goes up and Iron Dome goes up to smash it, 
it's very dangerous to be outside because the shrapnel can kill you. And I asked one of the soldiers, what's the shrapnel like? I mean, is it like, uh, you know, just a little piece? If it falls down, it's no big deal. He said, no, you'll get killed. These are massive pieces coming very fast from very high altitude, and you could get killed by shrapnel, and people have gotten hurt by it. Um, so you have to wait for the all-clear signal before you can come out. But they found a remnant of the Iron Dome system, of a piece of the Iron Dome that hit one of the Hamas rockets and fell on their kibbutz. So these rockets are more crude than any pipe you'd have, like, in your backyard. I mean, these are nothing. They're disgusting pieces of metal. Then the Iron Dome thing, we saw it, and we weren't allowed to take pictures of it, but we opened it up, and it looked like uh, the computer in uh, a space shuttle. I mean, there were hundreds of microchips and wires and so forth. To send a rocket, $500. To try and intercept it, $100,000. So it's not a great thing for Israel to keep having to be in this. But it was incredible to see inside it. She kept it under her house. I mean, it was incredible. She had like a little cubby. So that's Chen. Oh, wait. Uh, there's more soldiers. Okay. This is incredible. This is also Kibbutz Aza, Kfar Aza. This is the border of the kibbutz. And uh, there's a lot of barbed wire and they're afraid of infiltrations because they're always terrorists trying to come in and attack them. But this is their farmland. And these buildings up here, that's Gaza. We were only a kilometer here from Gaza. That's how close we were. Surreal. So, you know, it's one thing to go there. Have any of you ever been there? Have any of you ever been to the southern border? Okay, a few of you. It's intense. I mean, I've been there now three times. And the first time I saw Gaza, I was like, oh my gosh. This is crazy. I never thought I'd see Gaza. But these people, it's in their backyard. They see it all day long. By the way, it used to be that the Jews who lived there would go to Gaza all the time. And people got along just fine. And they would go to restaurants and they would do business. It wasn't always like this. You know when this started? When Hamas came to town. All This whole... The whole problem is Hamas. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Now you have to go through a lot. Um, but it, it used to be people got along. By the way, you know that Israel has this new relationship with Dubai. So, uh, well, UAE, Dubai is a city, but with the UAE and Bahrain and Morocco and so forth. So the... The guys from Dubai, they dress very distinctly. You know, they have these big white gowns and these white... So, people think that Israel's... You know, people argue that Israel's a racist country. So, two Arabs from the Galilee dressed up as people like Dubai. Like, in the Dubai garb. And they went and walked around Herzliya. Which is a place where there's hardly any Arabs. And it's all Jewish. And people, like, came out of their houses to fall all over them. Oh, we're so thrilled that you're here. We love you, the UAE. We're so wonderful that you're here. They're Arab Muslims. How's that racist? So when people say Israel's racist, I say Israel just doesn't really like the Arabs who try to kill them. But the Arabs who don't try to kill them, they don't have as much of a problem with. There's maybe a better way of saying it. I, we met some of the Dubai... We met a couple of du Dubai uh, influencers. So what does that mean? We were in a... Uh, in our last day in Jerusalem, we went to a... It was like a home... Not a home, but like a center for kids with special needs. And it's called the Shalva Center. An amazing, amazing place. Uh, a hundred, you know, multi, multi, multi-million dollar facility where they're doing incredible work. And there were these group, there was a group of guys from uh, Dubai in their full guard taking a tour of the place. And they're influencers, which means they, they have a lot of followers on social media in Dubai. And so they were doing like a pro-Israel trip. So I saw them and I told everyone else in my group that that's the prince of Dubai over there. Or the prince of the... So they all went out. They want to take their picture of the prince of Dubai. It was really funny. They were all really excited. I was like, he's an Instagram guy. But... What's the difference? You have a picture with an Instagram guy. It looks like it's the prince of Dubai. They all look the same. 
because they wear those big white... Anyway, it was pretty funny. So that's what it's like to live on the Gaza border. You're one kilometer away. I mean, it's nothing. It's a pitching wedge. Yeah. It's a golf joke. Okay, this is back in Jerusalem. Anyone know who that woman is with the famous rabbi? Yeah. Thank you. One. Anybody seen her before? She used to be, I don't know, she's on CNN a lot. She used to be the spokesman for the army, spokeswoman for the IDF. She was Ehud Olmert's advisor when he was prime minister. She's the first woman in uh, Israel, one of three only, to attain the rank of colonel in the Israeli army. Uh, her name is Miri Eisen. Mary Eisen. So she came, to, uh, she came to speak with us. Now, and she is fascinating. I mean, she is a very, very intelligent woman. Um, but there are three things going on in this picture that are just only could happen in Israel. So here we are uh, at a restaurant called, what was it? Piccolino, I think. Was it, no, not Piccolino. That was in the old, it wasn't Piccolino. What was it? I can't remember. But it's in the area called Mishkanot Shananim. And it's not Montefiore, it's the other one. But I forget what it's called. Anyway, um, this is the old city right here. And if you would look down this way a little bit, you'd be at the King David. Um, and this area here is called the Brichat Sultan, the Sultan's Pool. Or is also known as Gei Chinom. Gei Chinom means no man's land. Now, why was it no man's land? It used to be in the time when Jerusalem was only Jerusalem. Like the wall, um, go back to temple times. In this area, nobody lived out here and it was very dangerous to be out here. There were bandits and pirates and so forth. And this area was where a group of people who worshipped the god named Molech, which is mentioned in the Bible, they sacrificed children to their god. That was in this area. And that area became known as Gei Chinom, uh, Gei means valley in Hebrew, and Chinom means like a, a free no man's land, but it's where the term Gehenim comes from. Gei Chinom, Gehenim. Gehenim is the Talmudic word for hell, because that's where they killed kids. That's hell. Well, today, it's some of the most uh, expensive real estate in Israel. Uh, in this area where we were, these, you have these apartments that start in the five millions. Very fancy area called Yamin Moshe. This is the area of the first settlement outside of the walls that was found in the 1840s by Moses Montefiore. That's where the windmill is. If you've been to Jerusalem, you know where the windmill is. So we're meeting with Miri Eisen. Now, why is this interesting? If a lot of... We were there um, a couple of weeks after Yom Yerushalayim, the anniversary of the paratroopers in 1967 conquering the old city. And what happens on that day in Israel is usually more right-wing Israelis uh, do a flag march. Mitzad HaDegel. They carry flag, Israeli flags through uh, Arab areas. It's very provocative. It's very Zionist. And it's a problem. And Hamas said if they do that, then we are going to... If they go through with this rally, we're going to attack. And who's at the rally? The most hardcore right-wing uh, Israeli Knesset members, Smotrich, Betzalel Smotrich, and Itamar Ben Gvir. Itamar Ben Gvir's posters say, Hachi Yamin Shiyesh, when he was campaigning, as right as there is. I mean, so far right, you can't even talk to him. The guy's crazy. Well, ironically, though, if you know Rabbi Fred Klein from the Federation, Fred Klein looks just like him. So, you know, there were a couple of places where we were, people thought he was Itamar Ben Gvir. Uh, and uh, I told a few people that that's Itamar ben Gvir. Be careful, he's crazy. People are looking at Fred like he's nuts. Um, so here we are talking to... We're in the Middle East. In the Middle East. The least progressive place on the planet. Talking to a woman who's a colonel in the best army in the region. That's an amazing statement in and of itself. In an area that in the 1840s was the poorest area in Israel. Um, and today, you can't get an apartment for under $5 million. That, you could write a novel just on that idea by itself. In the background was the, the flag parade going on. Like, all the way over here. Uh, by the way, you can't, kind of like when you're watching the Masters, 
you don't you can't tell from the TV how or from the picture how dramatic the elevation changes are. So if you know golf, then that's funny. But if you don't, you can tell this is like here, it's really far down from where we were. It's a big valley there. So the flag parade's going wrong in the back. Now we were we left Gaza around four o'clock. I remember it because there was another group there. Uh, and it was a federation group, and they had a, sec they had a sec federation, federation's Israel security expert was with them. And he came up to me. I was talking to him for a while. He was a great guy, an Israeli guy who was high up in the military. And he said to me, you know, it's for Hamas has um, said they're going to attack at 5 o'clock, that there's going to be an attack at 5 o'clock. And it was now 4 o'clock. And I said, I think we're done here. Um, and we, we, you know, we got on the bus and left. Because why did Hamas say they were going to attack at 5 o'clock? Because this rally was going on. So they didn't, Hamas could have sent a rocket. They didn't. What did they do instead? They sent a balloon. You know the balloons? Does everyone know about the balloons? Yeah. Sure, everyone? Okay. So what Hamas has been doing for years now is they send over these balloons, regular balloons. And they let them go and they fly over and they have incendiary, incendiary devices on them. And when they hit the ground, they burn all the crops that are there. And every time they send one, it burns acres and acres of crops and ruins the whole area. So they said, if you're going to go on with this parade, we're going to send some balloons. As our bus is leaving, the balloons flew over our bus. It was surreal. Watching these balloons fly over us. And then Israel that night bombed Gaza. So it, my wife, I'm talking to my wife on the phone and she says, um, you said this war was over. I said, no, I said Corona was over. It was a joke. I mean, eh, neither of them are over. But <laughs> I don't know, I thought that was funnier than you did. But uh, um, okay, so here's the, so I said there are three things going on in this picture. That's two. One is we're having this conversation with Miri Eisen. Two is in the back there's Matsad, the Matsad Adega, the flag parade that's, you know, potentially causing the whole region to go up in flames. And in the middle, there's a very famous theater where they have concerts. And I start to hear music. I said, I know that song. And then I recognize it. Like, I love this song. Israel's most famous performer had a concert there. His name is Idan Reichel, and he's got some wonderful songs. Idan Reichel. Uh, if you haven't heard his music, you should. He's out of this world. He's got a song called Mim Amakim, from Out of the Depths. It's just a beautiful song. If you've never heard it, go on YouTube and listen to it. So where else could this happen? Where you're talking to a female colonel in the Middle East, where a... A, a flag parade through an Arab, of Jews through an Arab area that caused Hamas to send bombs into Israel. And in the middle, there's a very popular rock concert going on. This is an unbelievable scene. Any one of those three would have been overwhelming. But to have all three of those happen to us at once, it was an another classic only in Israel moment. I mean, it was really a, an unbelievable moment. Okay. Um, this is very similar to the moment from the previous picture. There's not a lot more to add. It's still unbelievable, but no different than what we've already had. It's just, my, just a better angle of me. Um, again here, same story. By the way, the reason I have so many pictures of that is because my mom loves her from CNN. And so I wanted to get a good picture to show my mom. Anyone know who that is? Besides me, the other guy? That's a member of Temple Beth Am named Bob Grossman, who happened to be in Israel. He's the chair of our Israel uh, committee. And uh, he was in Israel on business, which he often is. He, uh, he's a lawyer for Greenberg Traurig. And Greenberg Traurig is the only American law firm that has a permanent presence in Israel. And he goes every month uh, doing business. So he came to have dinner with us. So that's Bob. That's also a better angle. Going the wrong way. Did we do these already? Other way. Okay. 
This picture might seem unremarkable, but it's remarkable. Because how many of you know in Jerusalem on Karen Haya Sod Street, uh, on, if you're walking like near where the Sheraton Hotel used to be or the Great Synagogue in that area, the Jerusalem Great Synagogue, the Jewish Agency Building. Anyone familiar with that building? The Jewish Agency Building? So the Jewish Agency Building, or in Hebrew, the Sochnut, this building was the Israeli government until 1948. So this was the room where the Haganah, where the Zionists were running the Jew, what we call the Yishuv, the Jewish community in Israel, up until Israel was established in 1948. And that building is still there. What is it today? It's the home of the Jewish agency, which is the agency that basically works with federation. This, where that woman who is like the tour guide, I heard, I'm blanking on her name, might have been Michelle. I can't remember. And she was an excellent tour guide. Um, but that chair where she's sitting is David Ben-Gurion's chair. That's where he sat. This was the room where they ran the Independence War from. And this was the room where they found out about the Holocaust and what was really going on in the 30s and early 40s. I'm talking about David Ben-Gurion, Moshe Shared, Golda Meir, all the heroes, all the Zionist heroes. Now, in this room, the one thing that she told us that was really interesting was the British often raided the building before the British left. And they would try to find, they would often come into the building and um, try to find the secrets of the Irgun. Or not the Irgun, of the Haganah, which was the, the Jewish army under Ben-Gurion. And they often found a lot of stuff, but the most sensitive stuff was hidden in this room and the British never found it. And she said, do you know where it's hidden? And I just... A guest, I said, behind Herzl. So she went over, she removed Herzl, and there was an empty area there. And she said, the British came in and they saw this empty area, but behind that empty area was another safe that the British never found. And a lot of the secrets of the Zionists before 1948 were, were hidden behind that picture of Herzl. So here we are sitting here, and it's, the, the, the table's new, but the chairs and the walls are the same that Ben-Gurion would have sat in. And it was an unbelievable moment. I'd never been in this room before, and it was really very special. Uh, he had just sent me a text saying, can you take my picture? That's what that is. <laughs> then he sent me another one uh, that said, can you try and get the president in the picture? So who's this in the middle? Bougie Herzog, who was just elected. He's currently the head of the Jewish agency. He took over for Natan Sharansky as the head of the Jewish agency, but he was just elected, like the week before we were there, to be the next president of Israel, a term which I believe he starts in two weeks. So he's still there, but he's about to move. And he came, he's close with Jacob Solomon. And Jacob Solomon from the Federation arranged this meeting and he came in and said, I don't take these kind of meetings, but only for Jacob Solomon, I'm here to see you. In other words, he was saying, I wouldn't walk across the street to say hi to any of you. But because Jacob Solomon, fine, I'm here. That was that, was that meeting. Uh, he, but he was, he was great. He was actually in Miami a couple of years ago and we met with him. I met with him and Ayel at Shaked. In a, in a very fascinating meeting uh, at a hotel in, uh, at the Diplomat uh, when they were here for the IAC Council, and it was really interesting. So he didn't give us any state secrets. There was not, no, but we got to, the coolest thing about this, because I've met Bougie before, the coolest thing about this was getting to be in the room where Ben-Gurion did business. But it was still pretty, it's always cool to meet the President of Israel. Um, uh, that, that's him saying, can you get the president in the picture? And that's me doing it, getting the president in the picture for him. Okay, now the last part of the, the present, how much time do we have? Okay, the last part of the presentation is besides what happened in the South, what happened in Lod. Now, I, I imagine you followed the war a little bit and you saw that one of the most, what Hamas did doesn't surprise anybody. Hamas always attacks. And 
we don't really have time tonight to get into why the war started. That's a whole different talk. I have that talk, but I don't really want to get into that tonight because it'll take me forever to explain, although I'd like to do it at some point if you're interested. Um, but what was terribly surprising was the fighting that took place in the mixed cities. What's a mixed city? There are about five cities in Israel that have balanced populations between Jews and Arabs. And for the most part, they get along just fine. And in fact, in a lot of places, they've made some real headway. In places like Jaffa, Haifa, Akko, Lod, and Nazareth. Although Nazareth, you don't really have many Jews. But in, in a lot of some places in the Galilee, you have uh, Jews and Muslims. But in those cities, what happened was riots between Jews and Arabs. And really the, the worst place, the, the ground zero of this, was Lud. Now, to be honest, I didn't know anything about Lud. Um, I've driven past it a million times. I know where it is. It's in the middle of the country near the airport. But this was really an area that was all Arab. And that the Arabs there were basically driven out in 1948 because of its proximity to the airport. And it was unsafe to have them there. And, you know, look, that's what happens in war. You know, if you're the Jews fighting the Arabs and you don't want to have Arabs in places where they can help defeat your army, you need to move them. And some of them did. But most of those Arabs came back. And that's why Lod today, not most, a fair bit. But Lod is, a, is an Arab, has a very large Arab community today. However, it is about 70% Jewish. Now, the areas that we were in were mostly Arab. And what happened in that er when that area is something very interesting. You're looking at a yeshiva that was, that was firebombed. And you can see the windows missing. And the floor is brand new. It was just put in by the government because the other one was destroyed. Um, now, who were, what is this yeshiva? And why, why, was, why is there this yeshiva there in the middle of a very Arab neighborhood. So there is this group of people, Orthodox, very Orthodox Jews, very right wing, called um, Garin Torani, which means like, the, it, it translates to the nucleus of the Torah. But they're basically like settlers. Their goal is to move into areas where there's mostly Arabs and establish a Jewish presence. So that everywhere in Israel there's, there's Jewish presence. But their method to their madness is to go in and get along with everybody. Not to cause problems, not to antagonize the, the Arabs there, to get along with them and to work with them and to have, you know, good relationship. And what was so shocking about this is they thought that they did. They had Arab friends. And what happened for three nights was a total failure on the part of the police for a variety of political reasons. We could bring someone in, and I could tell you a little bit, but you could have a whole lecture on why there was a failure. But for three nights, there was rioting, and no police came. And every time they called the police, the police said, we're on our way, and they never came. Now, not that many people were killed. Only a couple of people were killed, which is a couple too many. But there were a lot of injuries, and there was a lot of damage, and a lot of rioting, and a lot of people who were terrified. And we heard two sides of the story. The first side of the story we heard was from the Garin Torani people. And they showed us, you want to know what happened? Look at our yeshiva. There used to be a window there. There used to be a different floor here. These are our books that we found. Burned. They came in and burned our yeshiva. This, is, this reminds you of Kristallnacht. And that's kind of how, this was a pogrom against the Jewish community. That's one of the most painful things I've ever seen in my life. In Israel. Wait, how could this happen in Israel? During the war last month. Yeah, a few weeks ago. This is, um, this is a Jewish home. I mean, it is an apartment building, but Jews live here. You can see they burned it. What happened was a lot of Jews ran away because they were scared of the rioting. And armed gangs... Arab gangs, went to their homes where they knew Jews weren't, broke into the houses and burned the houses down. Or burned the apartments. And this happened a lot. 
So they took us to some of these apartments, and that's what it looked like, that's what it looked on the outside, and this is what it looked on the inside. So we're walking through. That's Dan Levin from Boca, but you could see the devastation. These, you can't go back to these apartments. They're destroyed. I'll tell you what, though. Living by Ga the people who live by Gaza, Adi, whose house was bombed, has a private pool. And, you know, he lost his kitchen. Now he got a new kitchen, but he has a beautiful home. This, the poverty of Lud was devastating. To see, not just Jews, but to see anyone live in that kind of poverty is so depressing. Um, and, and Lud is a city for essentially disadvantaged, economically disadvantaged. And it, it, was, it was really hard to see the, the, the I mean, just filthy city. I mean, it was just really depressing to see this area. Are there some nicer parts of Lud? Yeah, there are. But even those aren't that nice. And the parts that aren't nice, the poverty is crushing. And, and it's hard to watch. Um, and, you know, poverty doesn't help relations. You know, who's, who... So one of the things that we heard is that things really aren't that bad between the Jews and the Arabs. The ones who are doing this are the gangs. Lud used to be the place you would go to get drugs in Israel. That this is barbarian, this is criminals and drug dealers, and they're the ones causing a lot of the trouble. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what some people were claiming. Um, okay. This is us singing Yerushalayim Shel Zahav on the way back into Jerusalem. It's very pretty, but we were not canners. That was clear. Um, this is, I just want to show you this. This is a place called, we went to this place called Vibe Israel. One of the things that we saw with this war is Israel may have won the war, may have lost the war. You could argue however you want to argue. But Jews in general lost big time the social media war. Destroyed social media. This is a company, a startup, like a nonprofit that we went to called Vibe, where they're working on fighting back in social media. And it was fascinating to talk to them and see how they're um, using the internet now to try to fight back and to share Israel's story. And so we talked to them, and this is something we want to talk to our kids about. But this is part of the war now. This is part of, uh, social media is very much a part of what happens in every aspect of life. And we need to be ready for it. So we spend some time talking to these people. Um, okay. Um, when the war started... Right before it started, it started because um, of what happened in this area. So this is driving from like the area, if you know where the, the Mamilla area is, David Citadel, the King David area, driving that way towards Mount, Mount Scopus, driving towards East Jerusalem. So it's right on the border of East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, West Jerusalem where the Jews live, East Jerusalem where the Arabs live. During Ramadan, which preceded the war, there was, you've heard about what happened in Sheikh Jarrah. So we went to Sheikh Jarrah. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, we, we actually couldn't go into Sheikh Jarrah. They said it would have been too provocative, so we couldn't go. So we went, we took pictures from afar. Um, but what was basically going on there um, was, that, well, let's put it this way. Muslims started rioting in Jerusalem for a couple of reasons. One is there became a game on TikTok. TikTok is an application on your phone where you make videos. And the game in Jerusalem was that these Muslim kids started was to try to take a picture of yourself on your phone hitting a Jew, punching a Jew. And they started doing it. Well, then the Jews started, you know, some right-wing Jews came to the area and started fighting back. And it started to rile some things up. At the same time, as they were starting to get riled up, um, it was getting too crowded in the old city. One, because of corona. Two, because they were playing the stupid game. And three, because they were really upset about what was happening in Sheikh Jarrah, and because, which I'll explain in a moment. And because it got so crowded, the Israelis blocked off an area by what's called the Damascus Gate, one of the gates of the old city. And this was driving right to it. And that's it. That's the Damascus Gate. And you can see that, well, you can't really see, but... On the other side of this triangle, there's a bunch of steps. And that step area is where Muslims like to hang out 
on their way back from prayers on the, in the evening after Ramadan. And they would sit there and hang out and have coffee and have a snack because they could eat now. And that was on their way back from their prayers to their homes. And it's just a place where they hung out. Well, the Israeli police closed it off because of the rioting and people, and that really drove them crazy. So they started rioting. And they started throwing rocks, and there was a fight on top of the Temple Mount. Hamas, sitting in Gaza, sees this. And they say, we've got a couple of real problems. One is, we were supposed to just have an election. And Abbas, Mahmoud Abbas, canceled the election because he saw he was going to lose. And Hamas was going to win. And Abbas, supported by Israel and supported by the United States, canceled the election. And Hamas went crazy because they were about to win. So one, they see we were going to win the election and you stole it from us. Two, Palestinians are rioting in Jerusalem and we have no part in it. And if someone's going to riot against Israel, we need to be the ones in charge. And three, and most importantly, and don't underestimate this, this is a, the, one of the biggest factors. We heard it from everybody we talked to. There has always been this idea that in order for Israel to make peace with the other Arab countries, they first needed to make peace with the Palestinians. Well, the Abraham Accords bucked that theory. Because now that Israel had peace with the UAE, with Bahrain, with Morocco, with Oman, with Sudan, with Kosovo, all these Muslim nations made peace with Israel and said to the Palestinians, we're not interested. You give us nothing. And what, what, did, what did all these countries realize? Th these Muslim countries? You get to Washington through Jerusalem. You get to Washington through Jerusalem. You want to do business with America? Especially under Trump, which is when this happened. You want to do business with America? Make peace with Israel. You'll be our best friend. And by the way, Israel's the only country that's going to protect you from Iran anyway. Because you're Sunni and they hate you as much as they hate Israel. So the Palestinians are furious about that. So when Hamas is angry, they only have one card they can play. And that's violence. So they launched a rocket over to Jerusalem to show that they were in solidarity with the rioters in Jerusalem, but really to show we control what goes on with the Palestinians. Well, launching a rocket to Jerusalem crosses every red line the Israelis have, and Israel took the opportunity to punish Hamas more severely than they've ever been punished. So we have to ask the question, why? That whole war was not about Hamas. It had almost nothing to do with Hamas, although they were delighted to destroy Hamas's terror tunnels. That war was a message to Hezbollah that if you attack us, we're not just going to send a few rockets back, we will obliterate you. And we're not afraid to do it. That's what that war was about. That war was a mess. And the whole time we're sitting there saying, why isn't Hezbollah piling on? I mean, Israel would be in serious trouble if they had to fight Hamas and Hezbollah at the same time. And, we're, and we, then we were told by everyone who knew what they were talking about in Israel, Hezbollah sees what's going on. That Israel only has one card to play against Hezbollah. Because Hezbollah has hundreds of thousands of rockets. The only card that Israel has to play against Hezbollah is total annihilation of Hezbollah. And, it, and they had to show them that they were willing to do that. So that one rocket that crossed the line led to 12 days of tremendous bombing. Now, what Hamas came out and said at the end of the war, Hamas didn't want that war. Hamas said if we knew that Israel was going to respond that way, we wouldn't have even started. But they were shocked that Israel responded that way. And Israel said, our hands are tied. If we don't respond this way, we show weakness to Iran and Hezbollah, and then they'll attack. And we can't have that. So you hear this word a lot in Israel, harta'ah. Did that matter? If you don't have a deterrent, you have nothing. So they had to deter. It was a message of deterrent. But that's where it all started, from that area right there. Um, it's the same area from the bus. Okay, that's Sheikh Jarrah. Um, this is the area where uh, they said, the Palestinians said that people are getting e uh, um, evicted from their homes. By the way, we're only the whole thing was only over six families. Now, six families in, you know, Muslim is 175 people, but it's only six families. Um, but, you know, you look at a building like this, here's three stories. 
A building like this used to be one story. And then they had kids who grew up, so they built another story. Then they had grandkids, so they built another story. And that's how they live, one generation on top of another. Jews don't do that. Jews said, we live here, you go to the nursing home. Right? I mean, there's actually something nice about it. But Jews don't do that. Jews don't have flat roofs. Because they said, you grow up, you're out of here. Right? You know, good luck. Right? We, we, don't, we don't do the, we'll just build you another roof thing. You know? Um, I got to speak at my cousin's uh, synagogue in uh, Kfar Saba. And they sent out an email. Uh, I know you would like to, I think I sent this to Larry. But yeah, they call me here the chief rabbi instead of, because their rabbi is from like South Africa or something and that's how they talk there. But it's something to think about. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, it's something I'm not, I'm not totally dismissing the idea. I mean, senior is, you know, I like chief, but anyway, I got to speak there. That was a thrill for me to give a sermon in Hebrew was, was really a blast. Um, and, you know, dozen people heard it so it was really great this is our group um, maybe you can tell where we are you can see here is the old city where the holy temple used to be and this is this is uh, up on mount scopus near the hebrew university uh, which is very cool for me to be there um, my family has a lot of connections to this area i'm very proud of this group this is an amazing amazing group um, this is my cousin's cat so his name's kiwi i got to meet him this is the sushi that my cousins bought me. Looked great, sounded great, was very expensive. It was mediocre. It was in Herzliya. That's my five-year-old cousin who I met for the first time. Uh, Yuval, that was us walking in Herzliya on Shabbat. Um, and those are my kids in Ohio. So that's it. Um, th that's the story. Um, um, uh, let's see what time is it. It's already uh, 8.22, so it's gotten pretty late. I'm happy to answer any questions about anything, but that's a presentation of my trip. I hope you enjoyed it. So, so. Yeah, you were there during the war. <laughs> you know, so my experience in Israel with this, with really seeing what Iron Dome is, it was uh, really very eye-opening because I realized what everyone in Israel lives through. Like when you're sitting here, you see it, you think you know it, but you don't really know it. I went through rocket attacks in Israel and
Oh. Look. Look, I'll leave you, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll end with this. Um, you know, if you live in Tel Aviv, like my cousins who lived in Kfar Saba, I said, he said, you know, I didn't even open my bomb shelter this time. I'm not worried about it. You know, there were only one or two rockets that fell on Kfar Saba. But if you live in the south, if you live in Stay Road, if you live, there, then you live in a city of thousands of people and every single per literally every single person in your whole community is traumatized. The, ki the scores of the kids on like the SAT type tests and tests like that is lower. The kids' growth is stunted because they live in this constant fear and this constant, constant trauma. And, but even my, my cousins in Tel Aviv, the one who has the new cat, they're the most pampered Israelis in the country. My cousin invented instant messaging. He, he has a home in Tel Aviv, $15 million home. It was five stories. I mean, it was, I've never seen a home like this in Israel. I mean, if it were in Pinecrest, it would be a dump. But in Israel, it was fabulous. You know, I was like, you should see what you get for 15 million bucks in Miami. But it was... So the fi that five-year-old boy, Yuval, that you saw, when he heard... I've never met him before. When, you, when he heard that I was coming, and that I was coming from America, five years old, you know what he said to his mom? He said, Arzot Tabrit, America, Arzot Tabrit B'Shalom in Israel. He said... He's coming from America. Is America at peace with Israel? That was his first thought. Because he knows, five-year-old, that there are lots of countries that hate Israel. He knows that. And he's lived through wars at five years old. So, um, I didn't get into politics. I just said, yes, America's... Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, we, we affirmed to him that Israel, that America was friendly. And then he was happy to play with me. Yeah. Qatar. They're getting from Qatar. Yeah, so, I mean, here's the difference. When Israel attacks Hamas, Israel has these bombs that, like, the bomb, they drop the bomb, the, drop, the bomb goes in that building, walks up the stairs, knocks on the door, looks for the terrorist, and then blows up. I mean, it's incredible, the stuff that they're doing. And they only tried to bomb where the bad guys were. In a war with Hezbollah, they'll have to carpet bomb the whole city and, and destroy the whole city. So the only, way to beat, the only way to beat Hezbollah is total annihilation. And that's what they're going to have to do. Um, Israel, but they tell you such a war will be devastating for Israel. It, and you'll see lots, high numbers of casualties. And they'll have to move the whole country to the south. Um, and even abroad, maybe. Um, it, it'll be horrible. But Israel will have to destroy, the only way to defend it is to destroy all of Hezbollah right off the bat. And Hezbollah doesn't want that. So you either have that deterrent so they won't start a war, or you don't. And they have to have it. That's what we heard. All right. Thank you all so much. This is great. I know it's late, but it's great to be back in the temple and to see you here. So.